Help MidVision keep bringing you material by becoming a Patreon member, as well as PayPal. Like, share, subscribe, and comment. Join the Patreon to get early access to videos and check out the website. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I had to make that sound kind of, ooh, you know. <laughs> We're getting into polygamy today, guys. We, we talked about some of the doctrines. I have Bryce Blankenagle. He is the host of Naked Mormonism Podcast. He is naked right now. So you guys know this is going to be really interesting, especially with the topic at hand. Um, and he he's asking for support here, guys. He needs your guys' support. Uh, you're not asking. I'm saying, please go help him out. Join his Patreon. Join his podcast. It's free right now to get on his Patreon, and it doesn't cost much per episode. And it's always juicy. The content. This is like the audio version of the Scientology Leah Remney uh, content on the Mormon side, except it's exhaustive. Where you might get nuggets on the Leah side, you're gonna get like exhaustive material when it comes to the Mormon history and what really took place in history. We also have David Fitzgerald author of the complete heretics guide to Western religion and the Mormons go down in the description, get the book. And he has a Patreon. You guys can help plug there. It's new. He just started it. He needs your help making it grow. And we talked about a lot of doctrines on the last episode. David, did you want to touch on that for a second? Well, we did talk about a lot and I could say, what do Macedon bones, moon men, Bigfoot, sparkly vampires and Battlestar Galactica have to do with each other? The answer is, they're all connected to Mormonism in some way. <laughs> and we could spend a whole episode just on that, but we're not gonna do you that. Know, I, I gotta say, it. once in a while, once in a while, you find yourself in a remarkable situation where you hear a sentence that you never thought you would hear, uh, or never, if you, it was said in any situation, it would never make sense. But here we are, and what you just said, David, makes perfect sense and it's just it's mind-blowing and fun and exciting and this mormonism is, is just so much fun it is just the tree that keeps on giving it, that is so true so true and on that note we could keep talking about those and we probably will but today we want to do a very special episode of our mormon series and just talk about the sex because there's so much sex going on behind the scenes in early mormon history yep uh, sex no i'm just kidding okay. all right <laughs> Very all right bryce that's the last time i'm hurting your ears okay i appreciate that and, and so viewers can see that i'm using like in-ear headphones so when derek whispers into his microphone it is <laughs> indescribably creepy anyway right yeah it's uh david likes it i mean <laughs> Differing opinions. Yeah, it's it's, it's okay. opinions. We we all know that David is into some some freaky stuff, so that's it's all good. It gets a little blue on the show, folks. Keep it clean, <laughs> dude. Bryce, before we got on this though, you were like, okay. I told you, I was like, man, we wouldn't be able to cover this in 90 minutes to do like an exhaustive episode on all the women. And it wasn't just Joseph Smith. This is what I love about what you do. Like I saw a video a while back on YouTube where the guy was like, yeah, 30 something wise. We don't even know really how many for sure, but like legitimately consented. Like there was a situation where union took place, if you know what I'm saying. And that happened multiple times. So um, he's not the only one. I never knew that i kind of figured other men did i don't know anything about this so i was saying let's stick to the most crazy stuff that we can think of like the most uh whoa uh holy crap stories in the polygamist side and it ties right into their doctrine like you can't divorce them even though they try to today yeah like we said last time we we were talking about the the, the theology behind mormonism and how a, an essential part of it was polygamy now we'd like to talk about how that played out in real life behind the scenes because polygamy in Mormonism, I mean, today for us, it's linked. You think of Mormons, you think they have all these wives. That's one of the first things mm -hmm. you think of. Um, but when it began in 1830, nobody, not even the Mormons knew about 
the blessings of Jacob or the principal, because the only people who knew about it were Joseph Smith and the girls he was porking at the time. Um, and it was kept top secret for years, taught to just a select few, and in actively, emphatically denied in print, in sermons, in public, over and over, repeatedly for decades, for years and years and years. Um, and as early as 1832, he explained to his innermost circle that the reason for all this deception was to protect the holy truth nestled deep inside all these lies like the gooey center of a Tootsie Pop. Because the Lord had vouchsafed that the taking of extra lives was a true principle, but the time had not yet come for it to be practiced, i.e. made public. Um, that said, Mormon historian Todd Compton, uh, author of the exhaustively researched book In Sacred Loneliness, The Plural, Plural Wives of Joseph Smith, which we have right here. Um, has Wonderful book. Wonderful book. <laughs> Here's what the numbers are on Joseph Smith, on Brigham Young, and other leaders of the church. Um, for most of the 19th century, only probably 20 to 25 percent of adult Mormons were involved in polygamy family, and the typical polygamist just had two wives. Rarely you had three wives, but for the upper muckety mucks, the higher circles, those went right up the chart. So for Joseph Smith, we have for sure 38 well-documented wives, eight likely wives with less certain evidence, and still other eight suspected wives who sealed themselves uh, to Joseph for eternity in posthumous temple weddings. Um, so for sure, we have at least 49 that we know of because uh, of that. And he didn't stop accumulating wives just because he was dead. We talked about how they had ordinances in Mormon theology that you couldn't start your own universe unless you had wives. So the way this would work is you could get married in a Mormon temple. And Bryce, if you want to jump into this, the time for time or eternity, feel free to jump in. But um, you could be sealed to somebody for this life till death do you part. And that's what they call being sealed for time. Or you could be sealed for eternity, which means you would be their eternal spirit wife slash celestial baby mama. And hundreds of women did that. <laughs> um, Joseph was immediately sealed to 66 or 67 women right after his death. And another 149 dead women were sealed to him as well. Um, and they continue to do that for decades. So, um, right. Well, and let's also point out, right? Like, so Mormonism is very nepotistic, right? And we, we talked about that in the last episode. Uh, the people who are running the church in the, the early Kirtland and Nauvoo era, uh, mostly those are the same families who are running the church today. I, I mean, obviously it branches out. And, and, and the polygamy in Utah, you know, Utah being an open polygamous territory, and uh, Mormonism only outlawing polygamy in order to gain Utah statehood is, is a fascinating subject in and of itself. But, <clears throat> but the, that, that, that idea of Mormon royalty means that the highest person that you're sealed to means that you will get the greater glories, right? So if, you can, if you're a woman who can be sealed to Joseph Smith, that means that you know, no matter how horrible your husband is here on earth, the person you're sealed to for time the person you're with for eternity is the prophet of the last dispensation, right? The prophet of the restoration that is as righteous and as awesome and as world building and cool as, as eternity can get for you. So there's a lot of incentive for women to be sealed to the highest person in the church that they possibly can, whether that be Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or Wilfred Woodruff or Lorenzo Snow or John Taylor or whatever. Yeah. And on the flip side, if you're a good Mormon husband, you go to your Mormon kingdom in the afterworld and think, all right, let's start making our, our planet with all my celestial wives. And you find out, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, they were just your wife for time. They've already been sealed to Joseph Smith. So it's like, you are a shit out of luck, my friend. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Prophet has got your wife. <laughs> it's just, right. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what? So they can't. Okay, this gets really weird and confusing. But I guess we should just jump into it. The one question I was going to say on that before we get into the actual examples, and I think we should jump right into it. We yeah. don't have time yeah. not to. You, you can seal them after they're dead. You can send them off. Say, hey, when you die, you're going there. Hundred right now, someone could do a ceremony, send their wife to Joseph Smith yeah. in the afterlife. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. So technically, there is a way. You just hope someone thinks about you after you're dead enough to say ah he can have my wife it's okay because right now everybody who's dead is either in spirit paradise or spirit prison 
where they're basically, as Bryce called it, a Mormon re-education camp in the sky. And uh, so nobody's in the place that they say is supposed to be at yet. That's not necessarily true. There are special cases. Uh, Joseph Smith. Uh, Wait a Joseph Smith, Wait a right? So oh, hold on, guys. We are going way into. You broke up. <laughs> sex. We got to be talking about sex. All right. <laughs> yeah. Say that up. again. Say it yeah, again. You, you, you broke, broke up. up. Go ahead and say that the way you Wait, just did. I stop? I stop. Okay. The whole thing. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Wait, wait, time out. Time out, guys. Back it up. We are going down another theological rabbit hole and we could do a whole episode on that, but we Thank need you. to talk about sex tonight. I apologize. Let's go straight well, into Funky Town. Right. So this actually, uh, Joe couldn't do stuff without justifying it biblically, right? So he has this concept of like the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the, the polygamous prophets in, in the, the Old Testament, that he used the, those guys as like his examples uh, and, and his theological justifications for these things, right? Yeah. And this fits into the, the timeline that we've been constructing over these past episodes, because all the time, you know, when we talked about Fanny Alger, right, like that was in Kirtland, Joe hadn't come up with like this, this expansive theology system of people becoming gods by that point. It wasn't until Nauvoo that that started to make it to surface. Um, and there's also the increased need for secrecy that you're talking about, David, right? Like where only the most elect people that Joe knows that he can really trust, only those people get to learn about the doctrine and only like the select of the select group actually get to practice it here on earth uh everybody else has to wait until eternity where they can acquire more wives and have people sealed to them posthumously right and this was so, controversial even in the church there are people like oliver cowdery and emma uh, smith who hated the idea of polygamy we'll get into that right. in a minute but basically there was a little civil war going on in the church and actually became a full-on uh schism after joseph's death um, yeah Absolutely. But let's uh, you mentioned, you mentioned Fanny Alger and let's get back to her because this is really where his career as a uh, philanderer starts is with the 17 year old girl in 1833, long before he starts, uh, you know, coming up with the theological underpinnings. Um, there was just this attractive, comely 17 year old girl living in the Smith household named Fanny Alger. Um, contemporaries described her as comely and nice, a very pretty, pleasing young girl who was loved by all. Um, in, her and Emma were very fond of each other. What was less known was that Joseph was also very fond of her until one day in 1835, when Emma is spying on them and uh, sees through the cracks in the barn, uh, what, how did she put it? Saw the transaction, transaction yeah. between them, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so in rage, she forced the girl out and we see this pattern occurring again and again in the Smith family household for the rest of their lives together. Um, that it, she's considered the first of his plural wives, but at the time he had not even come up with that yet. And yeah. it was, it was only, an affair. It was an affair, as Oliver Cowdery put it, a dirty, filthy, uh, dirty, nasty, dirty, nasty, filthy, nasty affair. filthy affair. Right. Um, and he lost all respect for Joseph after that. Um, and in fact, it's funny, after this happened, he issued an official denunciation of polygamy uh, while Joseph was away. And uh, it was later replaced in uh, a doctrine and covenant section. Um, well, and he was eventually. Let's, oh, let's, 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 let's solidify that point, right? Yeah. Mormonism in 1835 was a canonized monogamous sect. Yeah. In their doctrine and covenants, it's, it was uh, doctrine and covenants section 101 <laughs> that said, we decry polygamy uh, that no man or woman can uh, be married to more than one partner, except in the case of death or divorce, where either is at liberty to marry again. Those that's word for word. Mormonism was a monogamous sect, right? 1876 is... rolls along. They <laughs> decanonize that revelation right. that and they canonize now. the polygamy that revelation. 132. Yes, exactly. So exactly. So, and the ironic thing about that is that, the Book of Mormon also decries polygamy in multiple places. There's places where they're condemned for having concubines. Stuff. Anyway, Man, here's, that's, here's, that's a little that's a little more wishy-washy. Here's the thing, though, we, which we can't, can't argue about. The Bible is clearly pro-polygamy in the totally. Old Testament. Absolutely. So all these fundamentalists who talk about polygamy, they actually have biblical justification, the verses behind them to back it up. It's we 
today who don't do that that have to make up excuses for why it was okay then and not okay now. I want to comment real quick just to say it's not just the sex marriage stuff. This goes into racism, a racial division. You can easily see as a fundamentalist using the Hebrew Old Testament why a chosen holy race separate from other races, other people is better than other people because yeah. the God, whatever the God's name might be, chose them. And I mentioned this in the last show I did. White guy with a rebel flag from the South. He doesn't really know some of the historical roots to his flag, but nonetheless, he's proud to be a Southerner. White guy walks up to him in Walmart with a pamphlet. Says, hey, brother, I'm, I'm proud of that flag too. And aren't you proud of who you are? Why don't you come check us out and have a fellowship? And they go and he hears a preacher preaching from the Old Testament where pastors will never preach at a Baptist church and talking about racial division and why we want to remain holy, separate. And he said at that moment, this, this is a Ku Klux Klan member on the YouTube channel called Soft White Underbelly. He said, when I heard the Bible preached the truth, from the actual Bible, from this preacher that no preacher's ever preached from, that text, that way, yeah. Yeah. I knew he said the truth. And at that point, I knew that I needed to be part of my own race and blah, blah, blah. And God chose us white people and all that. That's what, the stuff that's in the Bible. Is, no, God didn't chose the white people. He chose the Israelites. You would have been a slave in that system. Right. That's would right. would have been sex concubines. So they're know? ripping off their, their book. Yeah, but yeah. It's like, yeah. It's, it's a it's, so adorable that you think you're the top dog and god chose you when just read the book a little deeper no the opposite is true you are one of those heathen slaves that you know need to be exterminated or enslaved i did it again guys i'm sorry i took us off the topic I forgot. <laughs> we're never going to get to all the sex damn it but no. i will also note that um in nauvoo there was uh, an immigrant who came from I believe it was North Carolina. She was a freed slave, Jane Manning James, uh, who came to live in the Smith home, uh, who historians argue and bicker about her role and who she was and where she came from and stuff. Uh, but she was um, Joe's only black uh, polygamous oh. wife, but he did have a, a freed slave polygamous wife. Wow. That is um, fascinating. I wish I had known that when I was putting together these notes, because according to Brigham Young, that would have been death on the spot for him. Because <laughs> right, well, after Joe's death, she immigrated to Utah with the the Brigham Young Saints, with the Brighamites, yeah. and she petitioned repeatedly petitioned Brigham Young to be sealed to Joseph Smith for eternity. Uh, and he refused. He continued to refuse and refuse and refuse and refuse. And finally, uh, something something happened, something catalyzed it. But finally, he relented and allowed her to be sealed to Joseph Smith by proxy. So she wasn't allowed to do it herself. Somebody had to stand in her place. A white woman had to stand in her place to be sealed to Joseph Smith as his eternal slave. Wow. The layers of irony the and hell? disturbingness just pile up so fast you can hardly keep up. Yeah, Jane Manning James is a fascinating character. Google her. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's... Just go ahead. Black in Mormonism alone is a whole episode right there. Yeah, yeah. That, that dynamic is, is fascinating. That's what fascinating. happens next, guys? I got to get us right. on track. Okay, so this yeah, yeah, yeah so hang on. Much. Let me, let me, let me take, a, take the reins for just a second here, right? Sure, so um, Joseph Smith is creating these insular groups, and he finally introduces this endowment ceremony in 1842, right? In spring of 1842, which is where we're, we are landed in our historical timeline, right? Uh, and he's got a lot of friends uh, in really, you know, bad friends uh, who are able to help him solidify and catalyze and, and create this system of um, an insular group. And the people who get this endowment ceremony are people who are being prepared to learn the doctrine of polygamy uh, or being introduced to it, or are people who are practicing it. Those who receive their second anointing are those who are basically given the green light to practice this new and everlasting covenant, right? So Joseph Smith creates this, this endowment ceremony, this system of, uh, you know, it's a passion narrative where they act out the, uh, the Genesis narrative and Orson Pratt is slithering around like a snake in the Garden of Eden in, uh, you know, he, he made up a costume for it and everything. It's, it's hilarious. Anyway, uh, sorry, Orson Hyde was doing it, not Orson Pratt, Orson Hyde. Anyway, still, uh, but, but they, they have to create these insular groups to control who knows this stuff because they, they, they have 
to keep it in tension. They they have to uh, they have to allow people to talk about polygamy happening, because then it, it's going to be less of a shock when one of those people uh, you know is proposed to by one of the church leaders. But they also have to publicly deny it because it's adultery. It's it, it's adultery. This is a castratable offense at the time for most people. Right, and he at some point he comes out with a pamphlet. I'm missing the name. I can't quite think of the name of it. Was it Udre something? No? Start over oh, from the beginning oh, of what around this that. time. Yeah, this this reminds me of something because around this time, Joseph Smith publishes a pamphlet under an assumed pseudonym, uh, pre preaching that polygamy is awesome and biblical and we should all embrace it. And the pamphlet gets the reaction to it is completely overwhelmingly negative. And he, of course, never put his name on it, but he has to. Uh, push back and say, oh, yes, that's terrible. Oh, boy, where'd that come from? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, I can I'm see not sure, that. I'm not sure exactly which pamphlet you're referring to specifically, but um, we do have uh, the public war over polygamy that is catalyzed at this time that, that begins happening, right? And a lot of this comes because of Joe's best friend at the time, John C. Bennett. Right. So so Bennett is this guy who is an obstetrician uh, and an herbal physician. He's mayor of the city. He's extremely powerful. He gets the Nauvoo Charter passed, uh, but he is also a scoundrel. He, he's kind of a monster uh, and he's a kindred scoundrel with Joseph Smith. Right. They, these guys both have uh, many of the same personality tendencies of opportunism uh, and of objectifying uh, of women. Um, so uh, John Bennett in 18 early 1842 here he sees what's going on and you know he's obviously capable of producing abortions and there are numerous allegations about uh, him you know conducting abortions on behalf of joseph smith um and the dude also ran a brothel right like so if you're a brothel owner and you don't have some system of birth control you're up you, you got a pretty short-term business plan right uh so he's you know, he's he's capable of um of forging relationships with various women to get them to work for him uh, in his brothel and also for uh, for women's care, women's health care uh, to deal with the, the, the consequences of polygamy because, okay. And, and I just wanna put a pin in the fact that we're talking about there having been a brothel in Nauvoo, a Mormon brothel in Mormontown. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Owned by Joseph Smith's best friend. Uh, his <laughs> younger brother also had a smaller brothel there. Um, so I, I want to point this out, right? So Nauvoo was situated, uh, you know, a couple episodes ago, we talked about the location of Nauvoo. It was on the Mississippi on this jetty uh, or this peninsula, I mean, and it was perfect for an industrial, huge industrial city, a huge shipping town right on the Mississippi. Um, it, it had many advantages, but the thing is, you don't just set up an industrial city overnight, you have to create the appeal. You have to get politicians in. You have to get powerful people to come and bring their money to Nauvoo and invest it there in order to build the factories to actually capitalize on the location. So the only, the only export that Nauvoo had for the entire time under Joseph Smith was debt. That's the only <laughs> export it had. It was just Joseph Smith's name that people would give him credit and then he would distribute that credit by land deeds and by uh, special favors and by trying to uh, start up public works projects and stuff. Um, what that obviously does is there aren't a whole lot of jobs. Th th there were just not many jobs in Nauvoo to put food on the table. Uh, and that sends a lot of women to, to seamstress work. Uh, and seamstress is, in the 19th century, a euphemism for sex work, right? Um, Seattle, I'm in Seattle, right? Like, Seattle was built on the taxation of seamstresses, and Seattle has never been a hotbed of the fashion industry. Right? Uh, <laughs> So, so women did a lot of seamstress work in order to pay the bills uh, and people would come in and visit Nauvoo. They would stop on their you know, journey on the Mississippi. They would stop in Nauvoo for a couple of nights. They'd stay at the, the Nauvoo mansion or one of the inns that they had there. And then these, these guys would have a, a nice weekend partying in Nauvoo and hanging out at Joe's bar and seeing the sights and touring the country. And they'd go look at all the, the, the temple that was under construction. And then they would review the Nauvoo Legion and they'd say, oh, this place is really awesome i would like to buy a house here or i would like to buy a business here or i would like to do whatever right um and and all of these deals were sweetened by the sex work that was that was a thriving industry in nauvoo 
Yeah. Uh, so John C. Bennett's services of, of obstetrician work, uh, of herbal remedies, and of producing abortions was absolutely necessary to the very economy of Nauvoo. And of course, the most beautiful, the most choice, the most elect, the most righteous women are reserved for the leadership of the church, Joseph Smith specifically, right? Um, and there, there are individual stories that we're going to discuss uh, coming uh, through all of this uh, and how this actually played out. Um, and I want to put a blanket content warning over all of this because we're also going to be discussing like Joseph Smith and, and, and other church leaders like locking teenage girls in rooms and raping them, right? Like there's some really ugly, nasty shit that goes on here, um, but it's, it's all part and parcel with the concept of polygamy and how it actually played out. But we also need to give voice to the people who enjoyed the lifestyle, who mm. didn't didn't agree with the the concept of monogamy, right? And there there were those groups. There were the Cochranites. There was the Oneida group that, that cropped up a couple, you know, like uh, you know, half a generation later. There were these free love communities that didn't agree with monogamy and practiced open marriages or practiced polygamy or polygyny or polyandry or polyamory in many different forms. Uh, Mormonism was by no means unique in all of this. Um, or no, no means a pioneer in all of this. They just had, it was its own special flavor of polygamy. Um, so th there are people who enjoyed this as well. And like for, let's say for women who are not attracted to men, but society dictates that you have to be married by the time you're 25, um, you know, her, uh, you know, having the prospect of a woman in the house that she gets to choose, it's, you know, technically her, her sister wife, but you know, uh, you know, that provides an opportunity for her to be able to participate in a marriage, be accepted by society, um, but not be forced into a strictly monogamous marriage with somebody who she's not attracted to or doesn't love. Bingo. And that, that brings me to a point I want to make about monogamy and polygamy today. Um, polygamy is still alive and well in Utah. There's no way they could stop it if they even wanted to, if they had the political capital to do that. They couldn't do it. It's too much. And that said, I have no problem if there's some soccer moms in Provo who are, you know, who love their polygamous lifestyle. Fair play to them. Uh, that I have no problem with. What I have a serious big problem with is the, the, the polygamy that's practiced in the breakaway, the fundamentalist LDS groups in Arizona and the deserts in Utah, where they are basically an American Taliban and they are uh, abusing and manipulating them and uh, selling them off to, it's, it's, you know, it's mental. It is sex trafficking. That's the, the word for it. it. Exactly, exactly. Worlds apart, they're worlds apart. Uh, it's not just, it's not just in Utah. There, uh, I've been watching, oh. there's a lot of YouTube content, people in Virginia. Uh, there's cults that, that are doing this exact thing you're talking about. And there's children trying to escape and run away, but they have no family to go to. So now they have no other choice sometimes, but to marry and they and they don't get to pick their husband. This is another crazy thing. It's like, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's where it's like polygamy in theory, no problem with it. It's right. Not a moral issue about polygamy. What it is about is a sexual abuse, sex trafficking, um, and growing up in a place where you're denied education, where you're denied decent nutrition, health care, where the boys who grow up become these lost boys because, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I've got all the wives. There's no room for you. You're just a potential rival. Um, so many effed up things about that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as we're telling in all these salacious stories about how this all began, let's just keep in mind that for as fun as it is, to tell these stories to a certain degree in a, at a 14 year old boy level mentality, as it played out in real life, it was horrific and continues to be horrific today. Right, yeah. there's and good, there's bad, and there's ugly in what's gonna be yeah. presented here. And some of the good might be on the side. You'd think, oh, I thought he was gonna bash polygamy the whole time. No, it's not. There's mm -hmm. some women and, and people that were cool with this, but then you go too far and there's religious backing and the culture at the time, the way That's they did it. these things. So. Yeah, That's, I got you. Like, let's also highlight that, right? So like the, the theological structure requires that the husband lords over his harem of wives. Yeah, You cannot have an equal power dynamic, an equal consent, an equal uh, information within the, the theological underpinnings of this practice, right? So like, I, I think polyamory is great. I have a lot of polyamorous friends. Um, and like, I think that that's awesome. 
I, I'm fascinated from an intellectual perspective of like how that plays out, right? And like how people handle, um, you know, like I, I, I have a time in my life for the relationship with my wife. How do people have time for relationships with 10 people in their lives? That's a fascinating subject to me. And that's, that's presents some interesting questions and, and, you know, interesting discussions and uh, some important discussions on the role of informed consenting adults in all this, right? The three criteria, informed consenting adults. Um, within a Mormon context, I am skeptical of the claim that it could ever achieve true consent because the religion requires coercion and it requires a patriarchal power dynamic that is impossible to overcome. And let's give an example of that because one of the things in mm. Mormon theology is that you are given a secret name in the temple and you have to speak that name to get into heaven, basically. I'm, I'm dumbing it down a little bit, but not by much. That's, that's it, that's right. Your husband knows his name and he knows his wife's name. His wife does not know her own name. If she does not make her husband happy, he has the option to say, yeah, no, you're not going into heaven. From, from get go. And there's nothing you can do in this life, period. It's like, if you don't make <laughs> him happy enough on his deathbed, what are you gonna do? There's no court of appeals. And that's just the kind of mindfuckery that this theology has built in right from the get-go, from the ground up. Right. And there's also mm. the concept of like these these ceilings transcend the I do, I do, till death do your part. These are celestial marriages. Yeah. Yeah. In order for a person to get a celestial divorce, you have to have a letter signed by the first presidency of the church. <laughs> right. And and there, there are, uh, you know, uh, personal friends of mine uh, whose names, you know, I won't I won't reveal here. Uh, but the, the stories of what the hoops that women have to jump through to get a celestial divorce are mm -hmm. mind bending. They absolutely break my skull into pieces because what it entails is basically a multiple years long interrogation process where you have to meet with your leader, your spiritual leader, your bishop and your stake president and go up the, the chain of command and you have to describe to them all of your sexual indiscretions. You have to describe all of your sins not even related to sex. And you have to basically come out and confess everything that you have done since you turned eight and were baptized for them to determine that your celestial divorce is, is warranted. And then you have to get them to write a letter to the first presidency of the church uh, and get that notarized and then send it to the first presidency. Um, and the stories are so abusive and so fuck and so degrading yeah. for these women because they're just treated like they're owned by their husband because they got sealed. And until they get that celestial divorce, whether they believe in the church or not, that husband has the celestial power to call them through the veil, regardless of who they marry and who they're loyal to for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So there's some nasty and ugly stuff that happens within these power dynamics. And that's when it works as it's planned. There's also a whole seamy underbelly of bishops who abuse their power and have molested the, the, the children that they're, who come to them in these circumstances and the women come to these circumstances. Yes. It's, it's massive. Thing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's dangerous. Take right. Me, so guys, so, take me into examples yes. of what's going on because I love this. I'm just trying to get us back on track. That's all. I, this is amazing. <laughs> Let, let's go let's get out of here for now let's put a pin in this for now and go back to some of the real world things that ha were happening in the 1840s and 30s right please uh, we we see an acceleration of joseph smith's marriages right so we had fanny alger the affair that that apologists will say that was the first marriage in, in the yeah. in kirtland in 1836 right and we and have again, yeah, and this, we, that decades later retroactively making her that exactly yeah. yes exactly right and so we have like right the hotbeds of mormon theology and development and timeline we have new york where the church was started right then we have kirtland where all of the ideas are prototyped all of the concepts all the communalism all of the shared wives and all this stuff is just in its very infantile and and very malleable state um, but the militarism of the 1838 Mormon War in Missouri, when Joe is excommunicated from his Kirtland church and goes out there and commits treason and war and murder in the state of Missouri, right? He's not paying a whole lot of attention to his love life beyond acquiring what we, we know for one 
Lucinda Morgan Pendleton, all right? Mm-hmm. And she's uh, she is the the woman who was this anti Masonic celebrity, basically, uh, because her husband had been murdered by Masons because he published an expose on Masonry. Uh, so Joe acquires this wife while he is living with them, with George Harris and Lucinda Harris in Missouri. Um, but once he gets to Nauvoo, that's when this expands and runs rampant and it's every week he's acquiring a new wife. And, and that's when this that's all accelerates. Literally. That's almost literally the, the line. And this woman came to live with the Smiths under their own roof. That's a hint and a half right there. That, oh, and soon they were married to Joseph. Okay. Uh, exactly. You've got to give me some examples and, then, and then give me examples of guys that weren't just Joseph Smith. Oh. But I want to ask how did Joseph's actual wife, which didn't like polygamy. I know that she played a role in this somehow. So hold anyway, on. hold on. We'll get there. We'll get yeah. there. All right. Let me start with Mary Elizabeth Rowland's Leitner. Yes. Because the thing I love about her is that she claimed that Smith secretly approached her in 1834 when she was 12 years old and said, the, the great vision concerning her that he was going to be the first woman God commanded him to take as a plural wife. And it wasn't Joseph's idea. He also informed her that an angel with a sword threatened to kill him if he failed to marry her. And incidentally, she wasn't the first wife, but she became his ninth wife at age 24 <laughs> while married to somebody else. Right. That does establish a pattern that is replete throughout many of these younger wives Joe targets them when they are pubescent, right? When they are 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, he targets them and they are marked from that time forward. And they eventually, almost all of them eventually become his wives. Nancy Rigdon is one of the exceptions. Grooming is what they call that in, in Grooming. psychological uh, abuse section uh, circles now. Um, here's another fun fact. Um, Joseph often asked his close friends um, and fellow uh, hierarchy members for their wives and daughters as a sort of loyalty bonding. Um, for instance, in 1842, he approached Apostle Eber, Heber C. Kimball. Am I saying his name right? Heber? Heber, yep. Heber, and asked for his wife. So after three agonizing days, Kimball, he says, with a broken and bleeding heart, leads his wife to the prophet and hands her over. But psych, Joseph didn't really want her. He was just doing it as a loyalty test. Um, and then a year later, Kimball offered up his young daughter, Helen, to become another of Joseph's wives. And he said, oh yeah, okay. And he totally accepted the offer. Um, now when her father told her Helen about Joseph's plan for her, she was shocked because she'd never heard of polygamy or plural marriage. And besides, she was only 15 years old and already in love with a boy her age. And so Joseph gave her a 24 hour deadline to make up her mind and said, if you take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. So with this ex- matrimonial extortion, he became, she became his probably 25th, sorry, 26th wife then. And uh, in later years, she wrote spirited defenses of polygamy, though oddly never mentioning the fact that she was married to Joseph. Um, and during her tenure, she wrote tormented poetry, confessing her loathing and temptation, uh, writing, I hate polygamy in my heart. And after his death, fortunately, she was able to enjoy the rest of her teenage years and then marry her childhood sweetheart after all. So that was a happy ending of sorts for one of his uh, plural wives. Um, well- I want to tease apart a social dynamic in all this too, right? Uh, Because these are women who are of marriageable age and it's not just Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner. It's not just Helen Mark Kimball. uh, It's the Partridge sisters and the Lawrence sisters and a number of other teenage wives. These are girls of marriageable age who are expected to go to social functions and, and court the, the, you know, marriageable age men who are their same age. Uh, but Joseph, of course, forbid them from attending the dances and socials and from ever fraternizing with the, the boys who might pose a threat to him. Um, and a number of the writings uh, from journals and from letters of these women reveal how much they were tormented by that fact that they couldn't socialize. They couldn't hang out with their friends because Joe was keeping them under such a strong lock and key. He's like a giant sea lion on the beach. He gets all the women and all the other men are just out on the other side of the beach waiting yep, for Yep, they got to sit on the pier. Yep. And here's another thing. When you hear uh, Mormons today defend polygamy, they act like, oh no, it was basically like social security for all these poor widows and older 
women who would otherwise have nothing. It's like, dude, no. <laughs> All these, almost virtually every one of these women were young, nubile teens, not elderly. You can tell there's a problem here, guys, because it, it's patriarchal to the core. Sure. It's so interesting, like you just described the, the big, the big, uh, uh, seal on one side of the beach with all the chicks and the guys are on the other one why why can't the women marry multiple men why is it only right. one man that all these women have to cling to and it being joseph smith which is so interesting hearing you guys describe this because the way you described his statement to her about all oh, the angel of the lord's gonna strike me dead that he i think and and just makes me wonder if he's had more experience that we don't know about where he has forced himself and realized there are better methods because you got to imagine it didn't start there he probably tried molesting girls and realizing i'll hurt you or something and that didn't work because it never goes well so let me make it about how i'm going to be hurt let me manipulate you and make you think like i'm going to die if you don't do it and it's a manipulation there absolutely and let me let me give you another example because that segues exactly into this next case i wanted to give you uh, and in all these cases, look at, listen to what he's saying to them and how he, how he plays it off. This is Lucy Walker, who was 16 years old in 1843. Um, after her mother died of malaria, he sent her father away on a mission. He broke up the children among other families and took 16-year-old Lucy into their house to work for Emma. So one day he calls in for her and informs her that God had commanded him to take her as another wife. And he explained the secret new doctrine of plural marriage and asked her if she had anything to say. Nothing, she replied, thinking, how could I speak? What would I say? And she wrote a feeling tempted and tortured beyond endurance and wanting to die right there and then to be with her mother. Well, this is what Joseph told her. He ended with an ultimatum telling her, I have no flattering words to offer. It is a command of God to you. I will give you until tomorrow to decide this matter. If you reject this message, the gate will be closed forever against you. Yep. And she get pissed at us. says it aroused every drop of scotch in my veins. And and stared him in the eye without a word and said, I felt at this moment that I was called to place myself upon the altar as a living sacrifice. And when she spoke, she said, prophet of God or no, she could not take such a big step without a sign from God. She would rather die. So he comes up to her all smiles, beaming and assured that she would have one, a joy and peace that you never know. And after a sleepless night of earnestly praying for guidance, she says just before God, just before dawn, she gets her requisite sign. It came to her and she says, it was not a love matter, but simply the giving up of myself as a sacrifice to establish that grand and glorious principle that God had revealed in his word. So on May 1st, just after she turned 17, she was hurriedly, hurriedly wed to Joseph in a secret ceremony while Emma was on a shopping trip in St. Louis. And she admitted in court decades later that Emma never knew about the marriage. I'll, so there's a lot of patterns and trends to tease out of this and Joe tried every tool in the box, right? Um, so giving the, or telling these women that, uh, th well, these girls that God has commanded this, this isn't about me. This isn't about you. This is about God's plan. Um, there's the angel with the sword uh, who threatened to kill them if it didn't happen. Uh, there's also, um, it, there's the the pattern that many Many of these women talked about a sacrifice, right? Helen Mark Kimball, who was 14 at the time, yeah. um, Joe convinced her parents to give her to him. Uh, and she said, my father had but one ewe lamb, but willingly laid her upon the altar as a sacrifice, right? The, Which not, these, since he, offered, he was willing to offer her mother as well, but that wasn't accepted. Wasn't yeah, like, well, when, when uh, Joe told Heber that he wants... He's sorry when Joe told when, he, when Joe told Heber that he wanted Violet for a wife, that's Heber's wife. Uh, Heber and Violet accepted, and Joe said, Well, that was just a test. I actually want your 14 year old daughter, <laughs> wow. uh, Helen. Wow. Uh, and they agreed to that, right? Um, so there's these patterns of the tools that Joe was using, there's the patterns of the experiences of the women talking about sacrificing and about of the hurt and heartache, um, the scotch in her veins. Um, these women understood that agreeing to this uh, meant that that was that was this is all against their will, that the, yeah. that they are going to become his victims. They understood that, but they also understood that. What they were doing was purchasing the salvation of their family. Exactly. This so is, Joe would promise them 
ex- exaltation, godhood. Yes. If you just give me your teenage daughter. And the teenage daughters were informed that if you just give yourself to be sealed to the prophet and whatever he does to you, it's all the will and plan of God. Whatever happens to you, I'm sorry. This is the Victorian era. We know that you're never going to talk about this. Um, I'm sorry it has to happen to you, but you're purchasing the salvation of, you're purchasing godhood for all of us. So, uh, So just take that D, just take it. Yeah, just take one for the team. All right. I'm, I was going to bring up some more, but I want to skip straight to one of the examples where it didn't work, where this backfired on him. Because we said we know at least 49 where it did work. We know at least five prospective brides who spurned him. And one of these rejections blew up in his face so spectacularly, it cost him two of his closest lieutenants. So one day in 1842, Joseph invited 19-year-old Nancy Rigdon. If Rigdon, yeah. seems- Rigdon, hey, remember that name? The, the guy I call Hinge Pin Rigdon because the success yeah. of the church hinged on this guy. Hinge Pin Rigdon, his uh, Sydney Rigdon, his daughter, Nancy. Yeah. Um, he invited Nancy uh, Rigdon to the home of another Nancy, Miss Nancy Miranda Hyde. Uh, briefly, she was the one who he almost got, he got tarred and feathered and almost castrated over years before. Back in 1832. Yep. That's another story. Anyway, he greeted the girl, ushered into a private room, and locked the door behind them. And after swearing her to secrecy, he told her how he had liked her for several years and that he wished she would be his. He hastened to assure her that the Lord was well pleased with the idea and there was no sin in it whatsoever. The shocked girl went ballistic. She had already been warned about Joseph's designs on her by John C. Bennett, the notorious uh, John C. Bennett who also had designs on her uh she had snubbed his advances too so not only did the feisty I'm, girl- I'm skeptical that john bennett had advanced uh her yeah. Uh, anyway yeah yeah well we'll take that for any but in any case not only did the feisty girl not fall for his standard god has commanded me to take you uh as another wife she turns on him raging away and joseph's like flustered he calls in uh mrs hyde to help win nancy over and she tries to tell the girl that, yeah, I was surprised too when I first learned about celestial marriage, but she promised her it was true and a great exaltation would come to those who received it or embraced it. Um, you want to jump into about mothers in Israel real fast? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a great segue, right? So um, the mothers in Israel was a program. So, okay. <laughs> Keep it short. You, got, Keep it- you got a dozen guys who are taking hundreds of wives uh, yeah. and you have, you know, an entire system of sex work that's going on in Nauvoo. You got to have organization. You got to have stratification. You got to have uh, the women who you trust the most. Uh, you got to, you got to organize stuff. Um, and that's what happened with the relief society. Eventually Joe gave his wife, Emma, uh, the authority to organize a women's benevolence society, which the, those are pretty common in the time. Uh, most of the time they were, uh, they were organizing and holding rallies for abolition. Um, Cause well, it was pre prohibition era, right. Uh, pre suffrage. The only power that the women had was to organize and hold rallies. Uh, and they, that's what these benevolent societies were. And they were also for, you know, uh, for coordinating uh, labor. Uh, for yeah. sewing for the poor and for uh, for coordinating food and stuff like that, right? So, but in, in the case of Mormonism, they were coordinating a very different kind of labor. That's exactly right. Uh, it was called the Relief Society. The Relief Society. Yeah. The Relief <laughs> Society. Right. So I, so I within... didn't understand what you meant till the third time. This is almost like the cock crowed. For Peter, okay, and he realized I denied him thrice. You literally just interpreted what you mean by relief by yeah. saying that the third time. Wow, uh, thrice is a charm. You're right. Yes. So this this system is uh, the leadership of this is uh, staffed with Emma, right? His wife, who's president. I'm gonna I'm gonna screen share a little bit so people can see pictures of all of these uh, these wonderful people. Um, uh, so here's Emma, right? Here's Emma. This is, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't click the share button. There we go. There's Emma, right? So here's Emma. This is Joseph Smith's first wife, married in 1827. Lovely, blushing bride. Uh, this was taken right after Joseph Smith was dead. This is her mourning face. Uh, so he, she's the president of the the Relief Society of Nauvoo. Uh, oh, then I we also- A lot in her t- time. Boy, just look at that face. Look at that face, right? Uh, her secretary is Eliza R. Snow. Now, uh, I I have to admit this, and I want to be as transparent as possible. I got a crush on Eliza Snow. Uh, 
uh, for, for reasons that are far beyond Nauvoo Mormonism, uh, yeah. she was the most powerful woman in Utah. Uh, she reorganized the Relief Society under the careful, watchful eye of Brigham Young. But she was also, in many ways, she was a counselor to Brigham Young. Uh, she held more sway and power in Utah than any other woman and than mm. most of the men. Like mm. she is a powerful person. And she was also an advocate for suffrage movement. Uh, and she was an ally to the early suffrage movement that was cropping up in the 1860s uh, and 70s. Right. So we have Eliza Arsenault and the other people who are counselors to uh, Emma. One of them was Joseph's wife. The other was a uh, mother of Joseph's wife's. Um, so the entire leadership of the Nauvoo Relief Society is staffed with people who are Joseph Smith's legal or polygamous illegal wives. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and in the and meantime, so they're encouraging, they're, one of their unofficial roles is to the, not procurers exactly, but the, the, the helpful transition from women, girls who have no idea this is going on to yes, come join us and be our sister. Exactly. Right. So that tension that I talked about earlier, the tension of like keeping these things as rumors, uh, not giving enough information for it to become, you know, publicly verifiable and, and you know, prosecutable, more importantly, uh, but keeping polygamy as rumors and denying it publicly, but like letting it flourish a little bit uh, on the inside. Uh, the Relief Society was created as a system to try and control the rumors, but also to prep the girls to groom the younger girls by having them taught the doctrine of polygamy by older trusted women in the relief right. society who are already wives right um uh elizabeth davis durfee is one of these um uh th there there are a few of these women who are given the label of mothers in israel and they would basically act as liaisons to teach the young girls about polygamy and to basically get a finger on the pulse of how receptive they were. And then they would take that information back to Joseph Smith and tell him without the girl's knowledge what they learned in that conversation. And then Joseph would be able to tailor his, his tactics for that conversation, right? So we see how women who are victimized by this patriarchal um, marriage system become the perpetrators of that abuse. And as we know, in dozens of cases, that worked out just fine. It but did, right. So Nancy. with, this yeah, with Nancy. Times where it backfires on him. Okay, so yeah. what happens when it backfires? Tell, this oh, is the girl he has in the room by herself. And, well, her, his, and her lady friend, the lady friend is trying to tell her, oh, this is going to be great. A great exaltation will come to those who receive it and embrace it. But young Nancy says, if she ever gets married, she'd marry a single man or not at all. Then she threatened to scream her head off until the entire town came running unless Joseph let go of her at once. And that's exactly what he does because right. no one had ever done this to him before. Um, and he let her out. And the next day he tried again via a personal letter to Nancy. And in okay. the end, we still have this, this letter. <laughs> this letter is iconic. And I recommend people Google the happiness letter or, or search for it on YouTube. A personal friend of mine, a uh, thinker of thoughts, Jonathan Streeter, uh, did a presentation okay. on this uh, with historian Christopher Smith. And they went through line by line of the happiness letter and teased out all of the coercive language and the, the moral relativism that is presented in the happiness letter and compare it to other cult leaders like mm. David Koresh and, and these other cult leaders who have harems of wives yeah. using exact same terminology. It is baffling and amazing. And we have that letter thanks to John C. Bennett. <laughs> yes, who brought it out as a trial as evidence against him. But here, let me, let's not just talk about it. Let me give you a couple lines from this beautiful letter. Um, if you read the history of the church, if I may, if I may screen share just yeah. to show them what I found here to see if this is, I don't know, something that I think would be cool. Hold on one second. I'm going to screen share because I yeah. think the image will speak volumes to what we're doing here <laughs> you while see you're actual reading. handwriting. Yeah. Well, this it, 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 I, I, it's that, but plus you're going to see some context in this. So tell me what you guys think of this. Okay. see did that work no, let me see this. oh wait here we go here. oh hold on hold on that's not the one wrong screen that's yeah. not the one this is the one this is the one 
All right, you guys see that? There, is. there you go. Gotcha. Uh, I hope that helps. Just manipulation. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So we got a lot of figures in all of this. Right. So we have uh, a portrait. Yeah. Nancy Rigdon is up at the top. Then we have Joseph Smith uh, with his Book of Mormon there. And then we have Sidney Rigdon on the top right of the screen. Right. That's That was his second in command, uh, who was kind of uh, washed up by this point. Uh, bottom left, we have Willard Richards, who was, uh, or is that, or is that Orson Hyde? Uh, I think that's Willard Richards. The woman just below Sidney Rignan is the woman in question who is helping facilitate this. Um, uh, yeah. Nancy, Nancy Miranda Johnson Hyde, right? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Um, so yeah. Um, and bottom left, we have Willard Richards, who was Joseph Smith's personal scribe, who I believe actually wrote the letter itself. Uh, um, and next to him, I think that's Lorenzo Snow. I'm no, not 100 percent sure who that is. I think he's dead. I'm not sure who that is. Yeah, right. It's a dead old white guy. Uh, <laughs> next to that is John C. Bennett. That's a guy who was the obstetrician, the the brothel owner, uh, and I don't know who is to the right of John C. Bennett. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, a and you can see this is the happiness letter. This is yeah. iconic in Mormon studies. Yeah, here's here's what happens if you read it in the book today. It's presented as an essay on happiness with an editorial note innocently declaring, it's not positively known what occasioned the writing of this essay. <laughs> but when you read it, it's just little more than a verbal thumbscrew that includes gems like this. That which is wrong under one circumstances may be and often is right under another. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof until long after the events transpire. It goes on from there, switching back and forth between carrot and stick, promising joy and peace and obedience, but darkly warning that blessings offered but rejected are no longer blessings. And then he tries some bad poetry like, uh, be wise today, tis madness to defer, next day the fatal precedent may plead. And he informs her that God is more liberal in his views than we're ready to believe, but at the same time, he is more awful in the executions of his punishments than we suppose him to be. Well, for some reason, this wonderful letter of, of love and promises does not work on her. Uh, his touching words didn't just fail to win her over. They bit him on the ass because she promptly, promptly ran to her father with the letter. And Sidney Rigdon, who was never terribly stable at the best of times, completely lost it. He arrived, Joseph arrived to his house to find him wild-eyed with fury, demanding an explanation for his behavior. And at first, Joseph stonewalled and denied everything. But yeah. when the girl shoved the letter in his face, he broke down and admitted that the truth, though not before attempting to get him off the hook by claiming he was just testing her virtue. Um, Sidney Rigdon didn't buy it then, and things deteriorated between the two after that. And soon everybody in town knew about Joseph's botched relationship, uh, romance of Nancy. Um, and he himself blamed John Bennett for the whole disaster, and their relationship also soon crashed and burned. And, and I also want to point out that uh, Joseph, it, for women who refused his advances, he went on a character assassination campaign uh, immediately. Nancy Reagan suffered this. Sarah Pratt suffered this. A number of women who said, uh, no, you can't rape me. He, yeah. he destroyed them. Yeah. And anybody they were associated with, right? Like Sidney Rigdon was on his way out. Joe and him were having conflicts. But from here, like almost immediately after this, Joe tries to excommunicate Sidney Rigdon. He tries to remove him from the leadership of the church. And the apostles are like, hey, there's no reason to excommunicate him. And Joe says, I tried to throw the monkey off my back, but you've put him back on. Right. Yeah. Like Joe went scorched earth yeah. when these proposals yeah. didn't go through. Yeah, there was an incident, and I can't remember where it is on this timeline, where Rigdon came up to him, shooting his mouth off about something, and Joseph beat the crap out of him in the street and let him and let him go with his tail between his legs. I don't, I don't recall that story, but it wouldn't surprise me, right? Yeah. Like, uh, uh, Joe scrapped with a lot of people who confronted yeah. him in the street about stuff. Yeah. Uh, anyway, at any rate, um, as you mentioned, that was one of the damning evidence letter, uh, piece of evidence brought in the trial against Joseph was this letter. Um, another interesting se section, um, the Lawrence and Partridge sisters. Um, Emma can Smith we, can we, before we talk oh. about them, can we talk about Martha Brotherton really quickly? Super fast. Let's do it. 
Okay, yeah. So Martha Brotherton was one of the converts, and and a, a number of these wives uh, were converts from Europe who immigrated to to Nauvoo. Uh, Martha Brotherton was one of these who converted under Brigham Young. Uh, Brigham Young selected her and was like, "I really like you." Uh, so Brigham Young and Joseph Smith uh, created this scenario where they brought Martha Brotherton in to um, the red brick store. And I don't think I've ever shown a picture of the red brick store. Um, let me find it real quick, because this is going to illustrate where a lot of these transactions, quote unquote, transactions actually occurred. Is this um, in Nauvoo? Yeah, so this is in Nauvoo, and it is today. The building is still owned by, or is owned by the Community of Christ, the RLDS Church. Uh, but this is the red brick store, and this was used as Joseph Smith's makeshift like initiation room. And uh, the second, the bottom floor of this is where it was his owned store. He owned a store, right? Uh, the top floor, upper floor, is just basically an open room where they could do all sorts of things, including the endowments, including the ceilings, including all sorts of things. So. Joe brings Martha Brotherton to this upper floor here, and he uh, says, Martha, uh, I have a, you know, something to tell you. Uh, Brigham Young wants to speak with you. Will you hear him? And she said, yes, of course. So Joseph Smith leaves. Brigham Young walks in and locks the door behind him and closes the shades. And he asks her if she will be married to him. She says, I don't think this is proper. I'm not even 18. This is not okay. This is unacceptable. I need some time to think about this. And she's just trying to do anything she can to get out of the situation. And Brigham Young keeps pushing her and pushing her and pushing her and pushing her. And finally, she says, I just need time to think about it. And Brigham Young says, well, will you hear it from Joseph? Uh, and so she, you know, of course, she can't refuse anything in this situation, right? So she says, yes. And Joseph walks in and says, uh, there's no sin in this. That it is commandment of God that you are to be given to Brigham Young, uh, and that he is the best man ever. Uh, that he will treat you right. Uh, will you accept it? Um, and she says, "I need time to think about this. I need time to think about this." Uh, and he says, "Well, you can't leave here until you give us an answer." And just to let you know, just like with all these other proposals, that God will withdraw the blessings if you do not accept of it now. Uh, and she said, I just need time to think about it. And um, they didn't let her leave until uh, she gave Brigham Young a nice little kiss. Now, as Sorry, a result lost, of that. I think we lost you. Um, I got him. I got him. Maybe you did. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Um, no, I, I got that. I got that. Okay. What, I'm sorry. what happened there, we don't exactly know. But we do know that Martha Brotherton immediately went home and told her friend about this and wrote it down in a letter. And this letter she sent to John C. Bennett. Nancy Rigdon also sent her copy of the happiness letter to John C. Bennett because John C. Bennett was on the outs with Joseph Smith. Jo Joe had gone way too far for John C. Bennett to still be comfortable with. Um, and John Bennett had been excommunicated from the church. He had resigned as mayor uh, of Nauvoo and Joseph Smith had become, you know, interim mayor because uh, he was vice mayor. Uh, and Bennett was being hunted by the Danites, right? And this had happened after oh, shit. Porter Rockwell had shot Governor Lilburn Boggs from the Missouri Mormon War. Okay, okay, okay. So, hold on. So no, no, I'm not. I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. Oh, Get on the damn bandwagon. All right. So John all right. C. Bennett. John Bennett defects, and he collects tons of information about all of the stuff that's going on here, and he writes it all into letters that are published in the Sangamo Journal. And he publishes a series of these letters during this huge uh, data collection campaign that he does while he's leaving and while he is hiding out from the Danites, right? He is hiding out. He is bouncing around from Warsaw to Carthage, going out to Indiana. He is running away from the Danites actively every night uh, because they're trying to hunt him down and kill him because he has way too much information and he is very dangerous, in my podcast, I called this the Bennett meltdown because he catalyzed an absolute meltdown of everything that happened here. It went super critical. The whole thing exploded. And finally, uh, all of these women realized that John Bennett was their ally and they sent him tons of information and tons of documents. And he collected all of that and published it in his expose titled History of the Saints. Now, Wow. I did a live show on the death of Joseph Smith in Salt Lake City. 
And um, we just went, you know, we did a broad overview, an hour and a half of, you know, the life of Joseph Smith. And when I said the name John C. Bennett, a woman from the back of the audience cheered. She cheered for him. Now, John Bennett in Mormon studies is a rascal and he is universally hated among Mormon scholars, uh, Mormon historians. And when I say Mormon historians, I mean actual believing Mormon historians because he revealed so much. He attacked Joseph Smith, right? He attacked the one true gospel. But what he really did and why this woman cheered is he gave a voice to the voiceless. Mm -hmm. These women coming out by themselves and telling these stories never would have been believed. This would have, they would have been, their characters were assassinated. Women tried, Sarah Pratt tried, and she was a sale for this. Nancy Rigdon tried, and she was a sale for this. Martha Brotherton tried, and she was a sale. But they got this guy in a high ranking office in government and military, a master mason in good standing with most lodges, and they got him to sign his name to their stories. And that made it believable. That gave the voices or gave weight to these voices who otherwise never would have had it without his signature on their data. And how ironic is that, that it takes a thief to stop a thief kind of thing, because he is, except for, you know, shave the serial numbers, he is a second Joseph Smith with all the warts, with all the, and yet, yeah. I gotta, I gotta ask you guys. I, in our next episode, while we're still in Nauvoo, I really want to ask this question, what happened? Because we don't have that context in the narrative. And so this is so good that you told us a conclusion, or somewhat a conclusion, because we really don't. Look, guys, did the Danites get him? What happens, right? So like, you know, this is stuff that we can talk about, but I want to. That's a great cliffhanger. I want to ask something I think is important, because you had one more person that you wanted to mention, Dave, before he brought up the Martha lady uh, and what recently happened here. I want to hear that. But after that, touch on the sweetest, hottest, craziest stuff. And then I want to hear the positive. I want to hear a woman who said, I would love to be your, you know, is there something that comes out good? I know this is bad. And trust me, I'm not saying let's root on the system and what happened here. I just want everyone to know that we're not just completely biased to the hardcore end, even though we are biased. Like there were real accounts of people who liked this lifestyle. And maybe you can give a few of those before we close out this episode. Yeah. Well, I just want to just preface all this by saying you're not going to hear this from mormon historians uh, you know <laughs> no mormon that's going to tell. um bryce had mentioned uh the website of his his friend who has um polygamist information um you look on there you don't get any of these backstories of what was really going on or how they got into the, the very lifestyle. very little very little very, it's yeah. very selective yeah joseph it, smith's it, polygamy yeah. is a good resource for first-hand documents um yeah but you have to understand the broader story because you don't get it from the individual stories that are told on Joseph Smith's polygamy.com. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so Partridge and Lawrence sisters. Yeah. And let's, let's, let's dig uh, Emma Smith into all this because this is around the time that Joseph finally goes to his wife and says, Oh, guess what? I'm going to have a lot more wives because God commanded it. Um, yeah, <laughs> and it goes about as well as you would think it would go, uh, having this little talk mm. with your wife. You seem uh, skeptical here, Bryce. You don't really agree with that. <laughs> right, so I'm I'm in the fringe, uh, <laughs> believing that Emma was a much more active participant in all of this than most historians give her credit for. Uh, most say that she was completely ignorant of it, that she knew just a couple of them, um, I am of the opinion that she was very much plugged into all of this and that she was an orchestrator of it and that she was uh, very powerful in all of this and that very few polygamous marriages happened without her approval or at least knowledge. She's kind of the Epstein's wife, right? Just uh, like Maxwell, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. And, that's, and I don't argue with that, actually. That's fine. I'll just say at this juncture in time, uh, the, the we're, when he first when he supposedly allegedly first tells her about it um what we have some evidence that he she first threatened to take a second husband herself or to leave joseph altogether but for whatever reason however it played out she apparently resigned herself and reluctantly agreed to let her take on more wives so long as she could pick them and luckily enough prospective wives were already living in the house with them because there were two pairs of young sisters living with them 
the Partridge sisters, Eliza and Emily, and the Lawrence sisters, Sarah and Maria. Both of which were, both of those couples were uh, orphans as well. Exactly. Not Hmm. only orphans, but rich, wealthy orphans. Um, Right. So the Partridge sisters, right, Edward Partridge and Sidney Rigdon were best friends who went out and first met Joseph Smith in New York. Um, early, early on members, Edward Partridge dies in 1841, I want to say, uh, Sarah and Maria Lawrence, they had converted while living in Canada, and they uh, migrated to Nauvoo with uh, William and Jane Law uh, as basically their wards. And according to, to Joseph's private journal, on the same day he married the Partridge girls, he also bought a fine new carriage for Emma, which might have helped sweeten the pot a little bit. <laughs> Right. Uh, the, the Lawrence sisters also had uh, an estate that they couldn't control because they were under the age of 21, I think it was. Uh, that was something to the tune of like $3,000, right. which is, uh, that's a huge, huge well, chunk of money now. Actually, and even higher than that, the, the numbers I have is that he helped himself to $10,000 from the Partridge estate and $8,000 in English gold from the Lawrence sisters, okay. which ultimately resulted in a lawsuit against him, by the way. Um uh, the, the lawyer of which he literally kicked out of his house. He kicked him out by the backside. <laughs> well, anyway, all that aside, after a long and bitter deliberation, Emma at last said, okay, Emily and Eliza will be your wives. And they got married to, sealed to Joseph on May 11th, 1843. Unbeknownst to her, both girls had already been secretly married to him two months earlier. Uh, and and, and the, so that's uh, Emily and Eliza Partridge, and then right. the Lawrence sisters are Sarah and Maria Lawrence. Right, and they quickly become wife number three and four, except they weren't really wife three and four. They were actually his 27th and 28th wife, and he was nowhere finished accumulating more. Um, as we said, 49 that we know of, that we know of. So he wasn't even halfway done, uh, or he was just about halfway done, just over halfway done. Um, what the hell dude yeah well yeah it's also notable too that like he had his cake and ate it too right because like these girls were living as workers in the nauvoo mansion right um and i'm gonna find a picture of the nauvoo mansion really quick because um you know we talked about two episodes ago the nauvoo house and this was supposed to be joseph smith's hotel that was going to entertain people from all across the country and bring in investors all over america who are interested in seeing you know taking advantage of the location of of nauvoo as this peninsula in the mississippi that's the nauvoo house right that joe made like he commanded by god for people to buy stock in the construction of that house right this is the nauvoo house association uh house that they built by the time when he died it was only this complete right it wasn't completed until that rest of it wasn't completed until after his death what you can see in the background is the nauvoo mansion that they Uh built to basically hold him over until the nauvoo house was completed but he died before that happened right um, let me find a picture of the Nauvoo house or Nauvoo mansion. This is really so quick. interesting, guys. Right. So here's this... the Nauvoo mansion, right? So this is the mansion house. Uh, and the 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 hotel staff were his teenage wives and Emma, right? She was the boss. All of his teenage wives, the Lawrence sisters, the Partridge sisters, Jane Manning, James lived here. They were all, they were the, the hotel keepers. They cleaned the beds. They uh, emptied the, the chamber pots. They cooked the meals. Uh, this, this, this was... Yeah. This was, for many intents and purposes, this was one of many Nauvoo brothels. This was the Playboy Mansion of Nauvoo. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and uh, by the way, Bryce's uh, crush, Eliza Snow, was also employed there as well. Yeah, I got to ask you something about her before, before we get off Emma of her. caught her making out with her husband and kicked her out, you know, beat the hell out of her and knocked her downstairs. Uh, <laughs> that's anyway. disputed, but mm, you probably... <laughs> probably something happened. so so this lady is involved in this trafficking and she's okay with it knowing the prophet and his hierarchies okay um, is a strange way to put it because okay yeah it is uh because what other option did she have right are, wait and are you talking eliza or emma right like so if you're emma in this situation you know you can't control joe's libido no nobody can right. he can't control his own libido mm-hmm. what option do you have other than just accommodating it appeasing it Right. So right. that's what everyone was practically doing, unless they felt they had the guts to stand up and do whatever. But right. most people and, were silenced. And we see what happened to them. Sarah Pratt and Nancy Rigdon are both 
quintessential examples of what happened when somebody opposed the prophet and will of God, right? Like you, yep. you suffered if you opposed him and, and nobody suffered more than Emma herself, right? Like they, he, a couple of times he beat her. Like mm. he absolutely beat the hell out of Emma to get her to comply with his wishes, right? Yep. Like there were th these these were ugly times for emma so all that she could do was bide her time until he was removed or died yeah or arrested. Is, i Let's... can't wait till this guy dies by the way i'm just i'm just letting everybody know i can't wait till he does it takes a powerful man to take this powerful man out it seems or at least a group yeah this guy's like a like a non-stop freight train it, it, this yeah. is just crazy but the, but the cracks the 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 brass feet or whatever the feet of clay start showing the the cracks i'm mixing up all my metaphors but anyway the 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 flaws in his plan right only continue to grow and let me just jump into this because what was happening by now this is 1843 the the last year of his life just before the last year of his life um fueled by hard to ignore incidents like all these rumors of mormon polygamy began to go public enough to be routinely and earnestly denied in newspapers and publications and scriptures until finally in 1843, when Smith is on wife number 34, if I'm not mistaken, he announced this revelation to his church leaders. Um, his brother Hiram, who also had several wives of his own, uh, knew Emma was very unhappy and offered to break the news of this new revelation to her. And Joseph said, yeah, good luck with that. And he came back with his tail between his legs, apparently. Um, and as soon as this revelation was written officially, Joseph and his brother presented it to Emma, who said she didn't believe a word of it and appeared very rebellious, even though it mentions her by name repeatedly. Um, and according to the revelation, uh, Doctrine 132, still proudly reprinted in every edition of Doctrines and Covenants, Christ commanded the practice of polygamy as a new and everlasting covenant and declared that anyone who rejects the new practices will suffer damnation and not be permitted to enter into my glory jesus also said that the wife's consent should be sought before a man married another wife but if she did not consent to the plural marriage then christ would destroy the first wife and the husband right. would be exempt from asking the wife's consent in the future right that detail right there you just said david that's known as the law of sarah and there are very few other things in mormon history and mormon theology that serve to be a a faith shattering concept more than the law of Sarah. Mm, yeah. It says, just like you said, David, the first wife has to give her approval of every subsequent wife. But if she doesn't approve of it, she is destroyed and the husband is at liberty to take that, that second and third and fourth wife regardless Bro. of her opinion. Here's your carrot, here's your stick. Boom, boom, yep. yep. That is the most manipulative BS I have ever heard. Like, that is the next and it's it's like goodness gracious i mean i could see a guy in one case trying to like convince his wife of adding a third party or something right, right. This, this is not, god this is not, let's have a threesome talk this is eternal damnation yeah, you will torture you are going to yeah. die and suffer yeah. if you don't and it, there there's nowhere in that clause where it says well, you know, like, no, there's no, well, you know, this is it, baby. And if you don't follow in line, yeah, you can almost interpret destroy in a couple different ways. I wonder if there's some people who physically could kill their wife for this. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, no one's ever lightly destroyed. There's not, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. But there there the is. Thing. So oh. in the, in the text of DNC 132, and it, it is important, right? I've done a number of episodes on it uh, in naked Mormonism, as well as my book of Mormon, like DNC 132 is a massive revelation with so many implications, uh, but it also tells, it commands mine handmaid Emma to cleave only unto your husband, Joseph, yeah. right? Because there's dispute about whether or not Joe was like, all right, you can take another husband because you're allowing me to take these teenage wives. And oh, then he reneged on that then, deal. No, no, Jehovah told him. So, hey, his hands are tied. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so there's dispute about who that candidate was, whether that was actually, you know, St. Louis Bitterman or whether that yeah. was 
uh, William Law because you know William uh, Joseph Jackson said that Emma called William Law a sweet little man, yeah. uh, and he was William Law was a great guy. Um, okay. So there was a lot of dispute about whether or not Emma could partake in the celestial covenant or if it was just the men. Uh, yeah. And in that revelation, by the text alone, it says only Joseph can take multiple wives. You Emma, you get one husband, one yeah. dick the rest of your life. You better like it. And you know what's funny about that statement is that it says what you read there was interesting read, David, is that, well, if she doesn't approve, not only like all the pressures on the wife now, she can get destroyed, but the man can now act however he wants. He can do whatever he wants without her permission. So she has no voice. There was no voice in it ever. So, yeah. Never, never. It, never. Yeah, back deck from the beginning. And this whole bombshell is what ultimately kills joseph smith this sure. is the beginning of the end this is where it Ooh. all flies apart all flies apart i want to pause on that though i don't want to go too you know uh, th so there are there are a few more threads to pick up on this right because um joseph smith in all of this is, is he's he's a horrible misogynist right and he is creating massive systems of secrecy and abuse uh and uh, i mean for lack of better words it, nauvoo mormonism is a rape cabal right mm -hmm. like that's that is what is going on here and he is forcing women to get abortions who may or may not want those abortions um both physical and surgical which cause them incredible amounts of pain and suffering and it's all to serve his own selfish ends, to, to gratify his libido with theological justifications underpinning all of it, right? And he's not the only one who's enjoying all of the fruits of his labors. It's, it's his select boys. It's his best friends who are awarded women as commodities for loyalty. They are awarded these gifts, these mysteries of the kingdom, the new and everlasting covenant, as it's called, which is a broad term that's used by Mormons today to refer to celestial marriage being sealing in the temple. But that was coined as a password for polygamy, as, as you know, a way to say polygamy without saying polygamy. Um, so he's creating these systems and a lot of decisions are made based on what's going on in these systems and, and trying to keep a lid on the rumors enough and also to try and create a system of emotional and physical support for the women who are all caught up in this and that's what the relief society also did right um because these women are able to support each other as they're withstanding this abuse. They're able to help each other through it. And they're also able to, to basically be an ear uh, for each other when, when they're suffering. Um, and, and like, and th these women need this, they absolutely need this. And Emma is the orchestrator of the relief society, but of course the relief society gets co-opted by Joseph Smith because he is able to, um, I don't know how to say this, um, stratify, uh, the the leadership structure within the Relief Society. And this is only found in John Bennett's book. Uh, so most historians don't lend it a whole lot of credence because they don't see John Bennett as a reliable uh, account. Uh, I take a different tag. I think that John Bennett is extremely reliable um, with the information that he presents. Maybe not his own role in that information because he published his expose to try and divorce himself away from any of this criminal activity. Uh, but the information itself is, is, I believe, very solid. But we find in his book uh, under the chapter, The Mormon Seraglio, uh, the three uh, the three groups of the, the the Relief Society. The first one are the Cyprian Saints. And I'm going to read his descriptions of each of these very briefly because it's important to understand within the context of all of this. Uh, uh, the members of the Female Relief Society who are ever upon the watch for victims have the power when they know or even suspect that any Mormon female has, however slightly, lapsed from the straight path of virtue without the sanction or knowledge of the prophet or bringing her at once before the 
Inquisition in caps, right? Wow. So the the these the Cyprian saints, this is the lowest level. These are the women who know that polygamy is going on. They're on the watch for women who stray from the path of virtue um, and who they can bring in to basically target and mark to become one of the, the chosen men wives or to become a sex worker, right? Um, and then they, they bring them in front of these inquisitions that the Relief Society holds and they determine her chastity. They, they hold basically a tribunal on whether or not she is chaste and fit and worthy to be a member of the Relief Society. So the system of grooming that Joseph Smith established is now, uh, is now codified and streamlined for the women to be able to affect that abusive system. This um, is a system. This is not... A guy who's horny runs down the street, sleeps with your wife, or tries to sneak your daughter or manipulate one person. They have like capitalized this thing. It's a machine. Yeah. It yeah. is a rape cabal, right? So those are the Cyprian saints, and that's the lowest level of the people who know that it's going on. Um, and they're led on a little of the mysteries. They just, you know, they're they're basically told that you know the rumors are true. Um, the next group are the Chambered Sisters of Charity. And Bennett says, this order comprises that class of females who indulge their sensual propensities. The women who may enjoy a, a non-monogamous lifestyle, right? Without restraint, whether married or single by the express permission of the prophet. So one thing about this too, Joe was a gatekeeper for all the marriages that happened, uh, mm -hmm. monogamous or polygamous marriages. Mm -hmm. um, everything ran through him because he's a crime lord. He's a kingpin. Everything that happens in Nauvoo, uh, whether out in broad daylight or in the seedy underbelly in the alleys after dark, Joe knows about it. It happens with his knowledge. Um, it isn't until Brigham Young that stuff happens only with his knowledge, the prophet's knowledge and approval. But Joe knows what's going on. He's got birdies everywhere, right? So that's the second degree. And and it's it's no coincidence that these women are broken up into three separate degrees and that Emma says that um, we are here to determine if you are good Masons, right? So this is patterned after Masonic societies uh, and Masonic uh, hierarchical structures. Uh, so the second degree is these chambered sisters of charity. And finally, the third degree, the highest ascension that these women can achieve is the consecratees of the cloister or the cloistered saints. Now, if you understand the term consecrate in Mormonism, that is the system of communalistic living. When you consecrate property to the church, you're giving your capital owned property to the church to do whatever the church needs to, to do with that property. Um, Mormon communalism was some of the earliest tenets that are you know captured in the Book of Mormon. It doesn't even take Joe's later revelations to create a system of Mormon communalism. These are the consecrated sisters. These are literally the way you consecrate your property, you consecrate yourself as a woman to the use of the church. Now it says, this degree is compri uh, composed of females, whether married or unmarried, who by an express grant and gift of God through his prophet, the Holy Joe, are ah. set apart and consecrated to the use and benefit of particular individuals as secret spiritual wives. These are the most chosen, perfect, elect, and oftentimes most beautiful sisters that the men are able to pass around to each other. Um, and Sidney Rigdon even said that uh, that um, Willard Richards and um, and another man were like passing around one of these women as, under he called it the sanctimonious garb of priesthood, right? Um, but these were important and powerful women in the Mormon hierarchy and in the Relief Society leadership. One of which was Eliza R. Snow, right? Um, Another expose that was written about early Mormonism, uh, Nauvoo Mormonism, was written by a guy named Joseph Jackson. And this guy joins the church. He's, he's another scoundrel, another opportunist, but he joins the church. He gets on Joe's good graces. He says that the whole botched uh, Governor Boggs assassination thing that Porter Rockwell screwed up and now Porter's in jail. Hey, tell you what, Joe give me everything that I need to accomplish this. And I'll go not only finish the job that Porter botched, you know, I'll go kill Boggs, finish him off, but also break Porter out of jail. Um, so Joseph Jackson gets on good Joe's good graces and writes his own expose of Joseph Smith. And he talks about the women who are special or who are quote unquote, great captains to Joseph Smith. Now I want to read from Joseph Jackson's expose. He says, 
He, Joseph, spoke of his spiritual wives particularly and called them great captains in his service to carry his design and remarked that through them, he could get any stranger's money. I asked him wow. that uh, how he would work the matter to which he replied that he had only to tell certain of his spiritual wives that such a man had been in the Missouri war. They were an enemy of the church, right? That they had been in the Missouri war and that he should be put out of the way and his property and money consecrated to the use of the church. Then said Joseph, it is damned easy for them to got into his good graces and mix a white powder with his victuals and put him out of the way. Whoa, not the last time we're going to hear about a white powder taking out a Mormon person. Anyway. That's right. So these women were not only participants in this rape cabal and bringing more women into this horrifically abusive system, but they were also participating in the criminal empire that's, that was mormonism that's what i was gonna say bryce murdering enemies of the gospel one of the problems that i see and this is just something i've been you know i like watching the tv shows id channel other things like where people are doing cult things like this it never is successful if women aren't participants in this matter if it's just a bunch of guys with libido and we think with our other head we're going to mess something up. It's going to crash before it even takes off. If you have women involved, the system will really like become something successful in, and I don't mean that to say it in a good way. I mean, in a bad way, really, but the fact that it, it survives and thrives, you need women to help oil and grease this thing. And this is unbelievable. You have assassins, you have the Danites and you have the females that are the helping you. Whoo. Yeah. So this, like, we also shouldn't mince words here, right? Like these women benefited from being great captains, right? They, they got the nicest houses. They got to attend all of the most exclusive cool parties in Nauvoo. When dignitaries and politicians would come into Nauvoo, these are the women who would be at the same parties, right? These, these women enjoyed an elevated status in society uh, that was granted to them by their their willingness to go along with the plans of a criminal kingpin. Okay, forget it, HBO. HBO, no. Quentin Tarantino, are you listening? Yeah, no, right? <laughs> yeah. Let, let me sure. ask you one more thing, Bryce, so that I have your words correct and I'm not misinterpreting what you just said. These women could be passed around, okay? Their spirit, they're, they're, they're married to these high men in the Mormon society, Mormon church, and they're used as kind of sex bait, so to speak, for people they want to take out. And they'll target the people they want out using these assassin type of women. And these higher, higher guys are okay with like sending them in. Are these also being shared amongst each other, like these women? Well, that's that taps into some large questions that historians bicker about uh, with Nauvoo polygamy in general. And to be clear, um, yes, everything that you said, yeah, those are essentially my words. I also want to note that um, using these women to assassinate somebody who needed to be put out of the way, quote unquote, put out of the way, that was probably exceptionally rare. And I don't know if we have any names of these individuals uh, who did this, um, but, but exceptionally rare uh, when it did occur. Okay. I also want to say that there, it was a huge spectrum. They ran the gamut, right? Because in that same uh, expose that Jackson talks about these certain women who were the great captains. He also talks about the women who were the the standard seamstresses who were so abused and degraded and they were promised that they would have food on their table if they just were married uh, but that he found them in just destitute and starving situations and they were just degraded. They, they were defiled and they they were just they were the lowest of the low, the cheapest of the cheap sex workers. Wow. And so it ran this, this spectrum. It ran this whole gamut, right? And at the higher echelons, right? You're a system, uh, you're, you're creating this system of 
of polygamy that we call it today. But in many ways, it's also an experiment in free love, right? Like if we're all, it's, and this is part of the theology, and I'm glad why we did last episode on the theology of this, because the theology also underpins all this. We're all members of this huge celestial family, right? And, and, and what are these, these stupid divides that we place on each other in this temporal affair uh, that we call marriage, matrimony? What even is that? We're all part of this same huge celestial family. We all get to enjoy what it is to be human and to exist and to survive and happiness and pleasure and all of these things and things that are wrong under one circumstance may very well be right under another circumstance. So there are people who are also experimenting in this secretive group of free love that are probably also really having a good time and really enjoying it. And, and, and to say that the, some women were being passed around implies that it's like the man controlling it but also provide an, op an opportunity for women to say, you know, I, I'm not really turned on by my husband. Um, you know, if, if I if I uh, go to another person, another man in this 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 system in this big celestial family, then um, you know, I he I'm more attracted to him, uh, I, and I can you know I can enjoy my time with him a little bit more. Um, so it runs this huge spectrum, uh, and it's all coercive. It all requires grooming. It all requires uh, systems of abuse, and it all requires uh, man running this at the top uh, in this patriarchal system, but also requires women to be leaders within the confines that he dictates of that system to get other women to comply and to go along with that system. Mm. So when people say just carte blanche that polygamy is abusive or that it that these women were all like it was all horrible they're failing to take into account a lot of the nuances that really exist within all of this and when people say for example that emma was largely unaware of all of these things that were going on she was president of the relief society and all of the leadership of the relief society were almost all her sister wives or you know their daughters were her sister wives like there's no way that she didn't not only didn't know about this, but that, that, that she wasn't also a part of the orchestration and the organization of this system. We need to pay attention to this fact. Emma Smith in 1844 was basically the most powerful and wealthy woman in America. Joseph Smith, in order to get away from a lot of his creditors, uh, attempted to file for bankruptcy. But in order to do that, he had to get rid of a bunch of his assets. So he transferred almost all of his assets to Emma, to his wife, to file for bankruptcy. That bankruptcy uh, application was denied, but Emma retained a possession of most of those things. So when Joseph is exercising power on, on Emma, coercing her into agreeing to him taking multiple wives, she also has a lot of cards in her hand. Um, and that is the optics of the perfect Mormon couple that Joseph and Emma are. She has the power to file for divorce and to leave him. How does that look to the prophet, right? That is a lot of problems. She holds a lot of that power in her hands. She holds more property in Nauvoo, legally speaking, than Joseph Smith does. Incredibly wealthy. And more importantly, she holds power and sway over thousands of women in Nauvoo as president of the Relief Society. Emma is a lot more powerful in Nauvoo than most historians give her credit for. And to say that she was largely ignorant of what was going on here, I think uh, does a disservice to who Emma really was. Hmm. Should we pin that? I was going to say, we're not going to get much better than that. I will, I will wrap by saying um, the mantle of the president of Relief Society and, and Emma being this incredibly powerful individual in Nauvoo, um, Emma and Brigham Young hated each other. They hated each other. And Brigham Young saw that women having power was a massive threat. So he dissolved the Relief Society. And it wasn't until the late 1850s that he allowed Eliza R. Snow to reorganize it in Utah. Um, and in all of this, Eliza R. Snow was one of these women who I believe just outright enjoyed exploring sexual liberty, just, just enjoyed what this system had created because she was so damn powerful in Nauvoo as second in command to Emma. Uh, and Eliza R. Snow is one of these people who her own writings, uh, she's a poet, her poetry is 
absolutely amazing. Um, she, in her own writings, she reveals how she was conflicted when she was first proposed to by Joseph Smith, but that she came to love it. She came to thrive in polygamy. And <laughs> there, there, we should never try and be reductionist about polygamy because it includes such a massive swath of different experiences and different explorations and there is absolutely no evidence to claim that monogamy is the best system for society to be constructed around and that's just as true in the 1840s as it is today absolutely i do agree with that actually i know that a lot of people who watch might not that's okay but i i I have friends that uh have multiple wives for example and those wives like each other but they also are his and you know like they they freely want that so this is not their dad or a religious coercion or uh you will be married to this person because uh his dad gave me three donkeys okay like this is this is something they wanted they go to clubs that are like this this is the, the lifestyle they want and so um you know not everybody's the same so i really appreciate that this is just oh my gosh it shows how grotesque something like this is ultimately and how something like that could hide behind religion so well um but it also kind of explores like you said closing out there that there isn't it's not always darkness there i suspect the introduction to her probably wasn't good because it's a religious thing but her experiences in that thing might have been good for her and she says they were so it goes to show you like i suspect when joseph smith came up she's not like yeah i can't wait you know like (laughs) <laughs> There's religious demand, but when the actions start happening, she's turned on by it. Whereas other girls are not, they're not digging this. They're not like that. So not everybody's the same. And maybe if there was an open discussion without the religion involved, without the forcefulness, without this, and it said, look, what if we were okay as a society, we start to allow this open idea. Um, not that you're going to go to hell, not that you're going to get tortured, not that any of this, if you're interested in seeing Bob and Joe, and Joe's interested in seeing Sally and Sue or whatever, then that's a different topic. But we're getting into open marriage. We're getting into open <laughs> relationships, which I myself, I'm not even sure I'd be uh, comfortable with something like that. Just personally, I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. I'm very alpha male-like and very territorial. Um, I don't mean to be. It's just I was raised like this. So here we go with the way people are raised. So You're raised like that. I was. You're operating within the confines of monogamous Christian America. I'm this this puritanical idea of you know the nuclear family it's it's antiquated there's no evidence to say that it's the best system or even what is the best system but what we can recognize is that uh <clears throat> individuals who use systems like this for their own aggrandizement are always dangerous right and there's there's evidence that I believe that Joseph Smith even killed his younger brother so that he could marry his sister in law. Um, there's there's what? evidence that he that Joe even tried to uh, propose to his own youngest sister. Um, there, there's there's some really dark and seedy oh. aspects of this, right? Because one thing about Joe is he was never content. He always had to amp it up. He always had to be do do with the next more exciting, more taboo thing. And that amount of power wielded by one human being is dangerous. And we can never forget this. Joseph Smith was a religious revolutionary. He didn't want just Nauvoo to look like that. He wanted the world to look like that. He reveled in the term that people gave him, the Mormon Muhammad. He, he, um, uh, when he was taking uh, breakfast with one of his friends, one of his friends says, I suspected that, uh, you would have a small table like, uh, like Napoleon Bonaparte. And Emma looked over while she was fixing their breakfast and said, Oh, my husband is a bigger man than Bonaparte. And Joseph looked at her and said, that may be the smartest thing I've ever heard you say. <laughs> right. He absolutely admired tyrants and that is a dangerous human being especially just wielding this much power and that's only going to become more and more and more dangerous as we get closer to the end of his life and we're getting very close yeah that's right david any final saying here uh you know i meant to start out this uh talk with a quote from him saying 
Where did he say it? <laughs> we made David like reorder all his notes, so he's know, he's all sorts of disorganized. Sorry about that, man. Uh, <laughs> I can't find it. It was a quote to the effect of, uh, "Oh yeah, here it is." Whenever I see a pretty woman, I have to pray for grace, Joseph once remarked to a friend. And we have gone so much further than that little quote took us because this has been so much more nuanced and fascinating. And again, Mormonism isn't just one thing. Religion isn't just one thing. It's a whole universe. And and we have really touched on a lot of stuff. And we're going to keep doing that through this series. And I'm fascinated by it. I'm not sure that uh, I, I, I think I relate to that. When I see a very pretty woman, I, I have to catch myself as well, naturally. But I know I have my, I, I don't know, I, I have walls that I, I have. Like, I'm very careful. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> um, and I won't get into my personal life about me, my wife, and how things are. But I ultimately will say that uh, I can relate to that, but if, if you go on without a leash and you have the power, goodness gracious, you guys see what happens, especially when it's ordained by God. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Joseph Smith, early uh, Mormonism, but you're going into the polygamy side. And the next episode we're gonna get into, we're gonna talk back in history. Goodness gracious, we are in Nauvoo and there's some crap going on. I cannot wait to see what's happening. I hope um, that you guys can see the darkness that can come from religious systems like this and why I love being a secular humanist who's focused on progressing and being a better human being in planet Earth. And ladies and gentlemen, I digress. So with that being said, we are Myth Vision.